Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Chris I'm very grateful recovered alcoholic. I'm grateful to be back. Um, what a cool panel. I take any one of these guys back to Texas with me, you know, pack, let's go. So it's, uh, they gave their story, man, on a Friday night, they gave their story, they're talking about it, they're all just riddled with solution. How can you get any better than that? You know, it's just the bomb. A uh, couple of things real quick. Here's, here's what I want to do. we got a couple more hours to go. Uh, the, the breaks are killing us because I know you guys are getting wore out. And so uh, we're going to – we'll we'll do a short hour and, and then we'll break real quick and try to get back in and we'll finish up the hour. So you guys – I know some of you are your time's constraint a little bit. Some of y'all are going to have to leave. Don't worry about that, guys, because by the end of the day, a lot of you guys, you got stuff to do and kids and things. And, you know, I'm not going to take it personal if you get up and leave. If you get up and throw me a finger and then leave, I'll take it real personal. <laughs> I take it real personal then. And, uh, yeah, I'll be worried about it. But I, y'all have been so good and so well. I, I um, some thoughts uh, when the, um, uh, the 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 panel were, were, were talking earlier. Uh, I've been accused of being a step technician. I might want to make one thing really clear. I think Bill Wilson, when he wrote the Big Book, he got really clear about the steps and how open and roomy they are. I'm not really sure. I, I really care how you work the steps. I'm as, I know that comes as a surprise to some of you. You know, the book is specific and precise, and I, I can appreciate that. That's what it says. And I think my experience shows that the closer I can align myself to the way the book has given me the, the information, the, the better I'm going to do. But I think, I think we get... You know, is it the spirit of the law or the letter of the law? You know, we get so critical about some of the way we do the work, and I think it's open and roomy. You guys are not relapsing because you didn't you didn't do a, a four column or a three column fourth step. You know, you you got drunk because you didn't do a fourth step. Y'all understand that? This, you didn't get loaded because you 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 didn't get on your knees to do a sixth and some seventh step prayer. It's rubbish. You you got you you got loaded because you didn't do a bunch of other crap. It's, it's not that critical. I hear people all the time out there. It's a, well, I, I got, I, I, I know today because I went over with my sponsor. I, you know, I, I, I forgot to pray this morning and that's why I got loaded. Wow. What well, do you, man, you need a different God. I, I, you, if you have a God that's that vindictive that you forget to talk to him one day and he's going to get you drunk. I mean, you, you might want to borrow mine for a while. Uh, we could help you out. <laughs> You'd, you'd be kind of freaked out with mine, i got to tell you. Maybe you better stick with the one you got, but mine's a little weird. But y'all understand what I'm saying? You know, don't, it's don't, we, we, we freak the newcomers out because we try to get too critical in the, in the, in the, in the structure of the step. And I'm going to talk about that. Um, when a newcomer comes in, you know, the first thing we're going to talk about, you know, is again, we're going to qualify this cat. And I want to give you the little rundown. I'm going to, I'm going to run through the steps real quick. You think, oh no, it's going to be forever. But I'm going to show you that this is really, really quick. Again, you're free to agree or disagree. If you want to spend more time with one step than I'm giving it, rock on. I'm just showing one of the biggest mistakes I think we make in our fellowship is that we complicate the bejesus out of this. We make this too hard to do, too time consuming to do. It was never intended to be doing that. If Bill Wilson was in Towns Hospital on his ninth day. He was still detoxing. He was writing some amends letters when he had his, his spiritual experience. He was doing the work in the treatment center when he had his barn burning spiritual experience. Everybody thinks he had this experience and then started doing the work. That's not how it went. This guy tried to get sober a gazillion times and was unable to do it until he finally got down. Little little knucklehead Abby going in there and 12-stepped his ass and drug him to the meeting. And they did, got on their knees and did a third-step prayer. And they did a little quick four-step in the treatment center. Quick, five. They didn't do it like some of you guys. Some of you guys, I see your four-step. you got two big <laughs> spiral notebooks. This is my four-step. <laughs> I've been working on it for two years now. <laughs> who, who are you, Satan? <laughs> I mean, I gotta laugh. I mean, what? What did you did you hate every person you ever came in contact with? <laughs> oh, I just think we we really make this way too complicated. So, and I'm gonna simplify it. So, some of you that made this complicated, you're gonna be you're gonna be cranky about it. I'm gonna guys, if that works for you, then just forget what I'm saying. In and out one ear, and not the other. I just I'm just trying to give you some some uh, some thoughts on this. That that in order to get from point A to from point B, you don't have to climb necessarily Mount Everest. 
You can, but it's not really necessary. <laughs> well, there's, there's, there's some selfishness to this, folks, because I'm, I'm telling you, because you guys, you're stalling out out there. You're, you're dragging your feet working these steps, and we really need you to finish the steps so you can help us sponsor people. The follow? Chris, you sponsor too many men. You need to hurry up. If you sponsored a few more, I could sponsor a few less. You'll see, that's honestly how it works. This will be good. I was looking in there earlier. Powerless in the book is, is, is said two places in the 164. Power is 30 places. God, if I never go into a meeting and listen to people talk about that anymore, I'm just powerless. I'm powerless over people, places, and things. Oh, my God. Yes, you are. And you should commit suicide today. <laughs> Come on. Book says, like, I'm just kidding. Lack of power, that's the dilemma. We want some power. Recovered is 31 places in the big book, in the first 164. Don't even go to the stories. It's dozens of places in the stories. Recovering, again, is only in, in one time. It's over in the chapters in the back about around with our families. With my families, we will always be recovering. To that, you know what I'm saying? That's just a fact. So, yeah. but, but with ourselves, we can absolutely recover. And that's the, what we need to talk about. My little brother was sharing it. We need to share hope from the podium. That's our one job. One job. If you've got no, no, no hope to share, then shut up. Take it to heart. Be quiet. Again, let's go eat some barbecue. Y'all don't eat barbecue here, do you? Let's go eat some fish. Y'all eat a lot of fish here. Great fish. Let's go eat. Let's go, and then let's hear about your day. But in the meetings, if you can't share some hope, just you ought to quit. And I'll say this and move on um, to, to talk about what I want to talk about. The problem is never an individual. I get calls all the time from people. We want you to come to Canada. There's this guy that's killing people up here, and I want you. To, we want you to. It's like I'm going to show up with guns. You know. <laughs> Here's the Texas boy. I'm going to come up here. I'm going to show you how to do it right. It's like this. Come on. Guys, the problem in our fellowship today is not individual personalities. The problem in our fellowship today is meeting formats, as I see it, just my thoughts. The problems that we have is that these meeting formats that have not been effective and have, and have brought about a whole uh, uh, tidal wave of piss-poor recovery and lousy sponsorship, we're still using those same formats. We'll be, we've been using it for 30 years. I understand that. How effective has it been? If you give a format in there that says, <laughs> if you have something that you might drink over, we would like you to talk about it. Bring your problems. Guess what people are going to do? <laughs> They're going to bring their problems. I mean, you can't be mad at somebody that pukes all over the table because you've given him invitation to do that. We need to stop that. The fourth tradition allows us to have meetings any way we want. The inner groups get a little tweaky with it right now. There's a lot of people out there with primary purpose groups that are using step study guides and, oh, we can't do that. That's against the rules and that's against this and that's against. Guys, we're using tools to just study the literature. How is that wrong? Have you ever been to one? No. Then shut up. How do you know it won't work unless you've been there? Y'all understand that? Any meeting that's got literature involved in it, it's, it's got to be a pretty good meeting. Pretty good format to share some hope with somebody. But if you leave a meeting open, this is open, this is your meeting. Who's got the problem? Ooh, shit, pick me, pick me. <laughs> and we're going to hear about your divorce again. Here we go. And that's it. And if you want to listen to that, that's fine. But I'm telling you guys, after a while, you get sick and tired of it. You follow? Some of you guys, you're not there yet. You say, I love it when they share from the heart like that. Okay. <laughs> I like soap operas too, but I don't want to live in one. <laughs> just, just a thought. Just a thought. One of the uh, things that Mark and I used to laugh about is that we used to talk about what happens in AA when a newcomer comes in and he asks us to sponsor him. One of the things that we do with this cat is, is that, that we always invariably ask him if they're willing to go to any links. Y'all ever heard, hear that? And we read it. We read how it works. Are you willing to go to any links? And we ask him. And the little guy, of course, what's he going to say? He's just in treatment or he's just walking in your group. He's all banged up, detoxing. Are you willing to go to any links? Absolutely. You want my money? You got it. You want my kids? Here, you can have it. I, I, I'm, I'll do anything to get sober. Boogers, snot, cry, tears, every Y'all with me? At, at that point in time, the most important thing is to not drink or drug, or do any of that other outside stuff. Just, I'm, I, I want to get sober more than anything. You follow? And, and it takes just sometimes a few days for this ego to rebuild. 
And we see it in treatment all the time. They come in and they, they're all banged up and then I'll do anything. I mean, lots of tears, lots of drama, lots of emotion. And then we get them detoxed. And about the time they start wearing off that freaking Ativan, you know, they start <laughs> coming up. They're, they're, they're feeling their, what was that on my face? You know, that's called air, you know, and it's like, <laughs> and they're looking, you can always tell when the ego's starting to rebuild because the little guy that, that two days ago was crying and talking and asking if he could just hold your big book. Can I just, you know, they just, they just want to be near some recovery. You know? Now all of a sudden, you know, a little girl walks by, you know, and detox and little, got little paper slippers and he, he looks up and, well, oh, shit, we've lost Johnny already. We did. It took, took three days and it's the next day you see him in the back of the room playing grab ass with this old girl, you know, and it's, I said, buddy, what happened to the urgency to get well? Well, uh, you know, I think I was making a big deal out of nothing, but I mean, I honestly think this treatment has been really good. I think God brought this girl to me. <laughs> God meant for us to be, I mean, I saw her in those paper slippers and I just knew, I don't know how, I just knew, <laughs> buddy, you're hurting bad. You're looking for something to fix you. And then she's gonna, I guarantee you, nothing will get you out of the spiritual malady than a good dose of romance. And it lasts for 20 minutes. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And then it's just going to be a nightmare. You know, these people do it in treatment all the time. Then they go to family and they've got their wife of 30 years sitting right here. And everybody on campus knows they've been sniffing this girl for a month. It's like, you look uncomfortable. I just go, I am, you know. <laughs> Un understood. But we don't tell them what it, any, willing to go to any lengths looks like. We always have this conversation after they relapse. Y'all follow? It's like our sane, sound, sex ideal. Why do we do the paperwork on sane, sound, sex ideal before we get into a relationship? What am I looking for in a woman? What am I looking for in a man specifically? We could do a workshop just on that, and I do sometimes, and it's fun to see what, what's really important because the problem is you guys end up with women. You say, I don't know why I ever hooked up with her ever. No shit. I, we, why didn't we talk about that before you did it? You follow? <laughs> You keep doing the same stuff, you're going to keep getting the same results. Nothing changes, nothing changes. And this, this is not about dating. Date, propagate. I, I'm all for that, but I'm just saying, let's, let's, let's do it properly. There's a way to do it without taking a hostage in this deal. So, so what does it look like? What is willing to go to any link look like? And so what I'm going to do with the guy that I'm sponsoring, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, explain to them. It doesn't take long, 30 minutes to explain. I'm going to tell them what this whole process is going to look like so that, uh, so that you know downstream when you start to crawfish with me that, that I'm going to be able to throw this back in your face. Remember two weeks ago when you said you were going to any length and now all of a sudden you've changed your mind? Uh-uh. Because I'm going to tell you tonight what any links looks like. So they say, somebody said the other day, they said, well, what if they say that they're not willing to go to any links? <laughs> like, what do you say when they when you win the lottery? It's like, what, what, rock on. How cool is that? So what? Guys, our job, we're not, we're not salesmen here. We're teachers. You want what I got? Do you want what I want to give you? Which is sobriety. You want that? I'll show you how to do it. But you're not going to do it your way. You're not going to get sober your way. Some other circuit speakers out there, they say it better than me. When you, when you get ready to finally start doing some things that you don't flat want to do, we'll know that you're ready to get sober. You come to this program with a plan, you're going to execute the plan. What I want to do the first night that I get you, when you walk into this room, I want to set you down and I want to make sure that you don't have a plan left. I want to make sure that, you, that you're done with, with your little plans and designs and that you're willing to try what we're willing to offer. And then I'm going to show you how that works really quickly. You follow? Number one mistake that we make in this fellowship is that we go too slow. I know a bunch of you will disagree. I'm, I'm, from my observation point in treatment, we go too slow. We, 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 we let them sit on their butts until they get absolutely crazy, and then they relapse instead of spending the time getting them through the work as quick as possible. There is a sense of urgency to get through that spiritual window as quick as possible. It's also easier for us if you're doing that. You know, follow? You're dragging this out, it, it'll, it, it'll, it'll take forever. This is one of the reasons we'll talk later in the second hour about piss-poor sponsorship and why we end up in that spot. <laughs> That's what it, but it's true. It's true. There wasn't anybody that ever came up next to me and tried to help me that wasn't trying to help me. They were. But, I mean, lousy sponsorship allowed me to spin my wheels until I, until I relapsed. 
first thing I'm going to do when the new guy comes in, the first thing I'm going to do, we talked about it earlier, I'm going to qualify this guy. Some of y'all have come up and talked to me about this. Guys, this is a difficult conception to get your mind around, this qualifying thing. Because most of the world out there believes that we have a choice whether we're going to drink or not. And the big book is crystal clear. I want to say this real quick. I don't want to get long-winded with it. The Everybody in here is breathing freely. There's nobody in here thinking... Thank you, God, for that breath. Thank you, God, for that breath. We don't, because we have, now, I take my little bony fingers around little brother's neck here and start squeezing down a little bit, and pretty soon it's, it's going to start struggling, and he's going to start paying attention to every breath he gets. We don't even notice it because the problem is not a problem. We have plenty of oxygen. It ceases, it only becomes a problem when we don't have it. Y'all, y'all on that thread, that little thread there? Okay, it's the same thing. When the obsession to drink leaves you, you stop thinking about it. And it's not like every day you get up and you make a decision to not drink. You can verbalize it in a prayer if you want. You can talk about it if you feel comfortable doing that. I don't. I don't. I think, you know, a bottom line, if I keep doing what I'm supposed to be doing, that that spiritual path stays there and the obsession stays away. I know thousands and thousands of alcoholics that have had the same experience as me on a daily basis. They're not worried about relapse, folks. That's the self-help people. That's the treatment centers that want to foster that idea. Y'all understand that? It's, it's a very difficult deal. I wish we spent it, uh, two hours just talking about that first step deal. But my job is the first thing is to set you down and find out if you're an alcoholic or not. Are you truly powerless? Little brother said it when he was sharing. Do you understand what unmanageability is about? Unmanageability hadn't got jack shit to do with your finances. Unmanageability doesn't have anything to do with your external world. My life is just a mess. We're not talking about that. Yes, comma, it is. What's going on inside here? Y'all understand that? I was talking to a beautiful woman last night who's a, 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 a billionaire, lots of money, beautiful clothes, plenty of everything. You follow? Now, how are we going to go to her and talk to her about being powerless, her life being unmanageable? Her life is not unmanageable. She has people taking care of everything. She wants to commit suicide. She's crazy inside. Y'all understand? That's the unmanageability that the big book is talking about. That's the bedevilments on page 52. Sitting in the rooms, many years sober, just not really happy. That's the unmanageability we're talking about. And if you can see that, then you can get well because you can start doing the things necessary to get connected again. That makes sense? We stop looking at the drama and the unmanageability, then we'll... we'll we, you, we, we, we keep walking into landmines when we do that. Lots of people have lots of money and they don't have lots of the drama. So stop trying to, to make that a part of this diagnosis because it's not. Internal condition. I sit down and I qualify this cat. Let's say that the guy decides that he is. He said, Chris, I am. And he gives me some examples of lack of control and no choice. You follow? We're, we're at step one. Somebody in the, in, the, in, the, in the panel said it so beautifully earlier because treatment centers talk about, you had your first step when you came to treatment. That's so much bullshit, it's not even funny. You just got your butt in the ringer and decided to come. Now you're here, but you still don't understand what it is to be an alcoholic. And that's my job is to teach you so that you can turn around and teach the newcomer. That's what that's about. A lot of you guys have got my business cards, and they've got a lot of heads that are looking like this. Not understanding what I'm saying. I would love the opportunity to make it clearer to you. You must understand that. The rest of this is just drivel, but you must understand what it is to be a, a, a diagnosed alcoholic. And I can help you with that. A lot of people in this room that have already there got there can help you with that. But there's a lot of treatment centers that don't teach it because all they want to do is look at the drama. Well, you can tell by looking at your life, you're an alcoholic. Got nothing to do with nothing. Clear? Okay. He says, yes, I'm an alcoholic. She, yes, I'm an alcoholic. Then that's great. What we're going to do is that I'm going to set you down now and I'm going to talk to you specifically about what we're going to do. I'm going to qualify you, one. I'm going to find out if you're in the right room or not. Is the alcohol your real problem? Every time you relapse, you smoke crack. Every time you went out, you ate pills. That was why you went out. So maybe you're a drug addict and not so much an alcoholic. You follow? You're welcome in our fellowship. I'm just not sure why you want to hide out in a fellowship that you have nothing to share. You you follow? If you have a problem overeating, you can go help other overeaters. If you don't have a problem with overeating, you can't do that. Theoretically, you can. You follow? But unless I've been there, I don't understand what that's like. I don't have a problem gambling. I got a friend of mine that's huge up to his butt. He's lost more money gambling than he ever did drinking or drugging. You follow? He's he's in a lot of trouble around it now. I don't have a problem gambling. I can go to Vegas and make $50 last forever. 
And when the $50 is gone, we're going to go to the buffet. Let's go. Rock on. I, I love it. Absolutely love it. He, y'all understand what I'm saying? How arrogant of me to think that I can help him have, having had no experience with that. That's what the singleness of person, purpose came down to is our primary. We're going to try to make sure we're teaching the right thing. Okay. I don't want to waste your time with that. I'm going to, I'm going to absolutely qualify them and I'm going to see, make sure if they're in the right room. And I'm going to explain the urgency. If they understand really where they're at with that, uh, we're going to get you through the steps in a quick line. Number one question I get is how long does it take to take somebody through the steps? Guys, it's going to be different with everybody a little bit. It shouldn't ever take longer than a, maybe a couple of months at the most. I'd say 30 days with most of the guys I sponsor. Uh, uh, the, the early guys did it in a few days, a couple of weeks at the most. Uh, Bill Wilson, again, was working on his ninth step and nine days in it. Dr. Bob, two weeks. Bob D., a little less than two weeks to work the steps archivally. They, they, you can look at the history of it. Nobody took longer than 30 days to do the work. Nobody. Uh, the absolute arrogance of us to take longer than that. You with us? Obviously, you don't understand the first step. Here's why that's so tough and why some of you are grinding your teeth right now is because we've complicated the bejesus out of it. You, I'm not saying that you can do this... Um, I hope that's not hurting. <laughs> you, I'm going to give you the rundown real quick, and I'll show you how that's done. If I sit down and I qualify somebody, there's not a person in here that I couldn't sit down with in 10, 20 minutes at most and qualify. You with us? Second step is one question. I know it's some several pages in the book. I can show you. I can email you. be glad to a little place where it will divide the steps up for you, what's, what pages they're on. But I can just tell you point blank. I, do you have a problem believing in God? Are you willing to believe there's something out there bigger than you? Well, I'm not sure. Well, let's talk about it at that point. If you say yes, we're not going to have another bit of conversation about it. I'm not going to waste your time. Chapter of the Agnostic says 50% of us had trouble with God. 50% didn't. So, so if this guy's been in the church all his life and we're going to talk about it and says, no, I, I don't have a problem with God, then let's move on. Why do we want to talk about it? Here's where everybody starts to slow down. Well, I want you to read these pages and we're going to talk about it. Why? Read the pages. Let me show you where the second step is in there. I want you to read it, but we're not going to mess with that. I'm going to cherry pick through this. Y'all know what the word triage is? Y'all know it's in a, I got in a, in a bicycle accident with a, with a deer one time and a, some of, some of y'all have heard that tragic story. But when I went to the emergency room, you know, I, was, I had road rash everywhere. I had gravel in my ass a mile deep. But, but the triage, what happened is they were checking my, my, my airways and the bleeding, and they wanted to make sure that I was stable. And then sometime later, way later, two hours later, as a matter of they started pulling gravel out of my butt. Y'all, y'all follow? First things first. <laughs> I don't want you wasting time spending three days reading those pages when you don't have a problem with that. Let's move on. Third step. Third step. Were you willing to let that power be part of your life? Yes or no. It's not a discussion. It's, it's not a... <laughs> Are you willing to let this power? Well, no, I think I... I uh, don't believe in God, and I don't believe in any power other than myself, and I'm really not willing to believe in anything like that. B bye bye, b bye bye. <laughs> I'm gonna get my coffee and go with my brothers, sisters. Go have a good b bye bye. -bye. It's not my job to talk you into believing God. You all understand that? Alcoholics Anonymous is a spiritual program of action. The solution to our problem is a spiritual experience. That's the only thing we have to offer. I don't believe in the spiritual experience. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> and some of y'all are grinding your teeth. They worked with me for six months to make sure that I understood that I can appreciate that. Good for you. Go get another one. But I'm not going to waste my time talking to somebody that's that arrogant. You don't think you're one of us? Go drink. Go drink. You come back in a little bit open-minded, a little more, a little more willing to believe. The guys, the, guy, the book's not asking you to believe like me. It's not saying you've got to be a Christian. It's not saying that you've got to be anything. You can pray to Mr. Magoo if you want to. All it's saying is, are you willing to believe there's something bigger than you? Well, but, but I don't like Jesus. I did. I, I, <laughs> 
well, what's this, what's this look like? Guys, I'm 23 years sober, and I think I know God a little bit better than I did when I first got here, but I'm still not real sure I got it all figured out. How cool is that? What a journey that we have here. Open your mind, guys. There's a power that keeps us sober. Are you willing to tap into that power? Also gives us enough power to, to do with everything else we want to go do. Manage my finances and take care of my health and, and, and to do the cool things I've wanted. Let's, are you willing to, to buy into this? A little bit. Yes, let's go. He explained the third step prayer to me, my first sponsor, and I do the same thing with my guys. One of the tenets in the prayer is that God's going to remove my difficulties so victory over those difficulties can bear witness to God's power in my life. It means that I'm going to have some ammunition here so that I can go back into meetings and talk about. And God's given me my, my marching orders. The third step compels, compels me to go back into a meeting and share hope with the newcomer. Do you all understand? I, I, you may have a, a world just that's crazy right now. Do you have anything that you can be grateful about? Any hope to share? And all that craziness, are you staying sober? Uh-huh. Then go into a meeting and share that. That's what the book is asking us to do. It's telling us that, the, that, the, that our, 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 our problems are going to be solved. Our problems are going to be taken to a different spot if you'll be willing to do that. Make sense? How do you keep that going? You go back in and share that hope. God damn, guys, that's all we got to do. That's, that's the, the gist of, of, of our shares is sharing hope with that newcomer. In 1987, after that suicide attempt, I didn't hear, need to hear one more drug story, drug story. I didn't need to hear one more junior therapy session. I needed somebody to just look me in the face and say, Chris, in a few days you can wake up and the obsession to drink will be gone. Not perhaps, not maybe, gone. Oh, we got on our knees and did a third step prayer. We got up, dusted our knees off. I'm looking around to see if anybody saw me get on my knees with another man. <laughs> ever, ever self-conscious. <laughs> and I and I got and I got up and he says, "Okay, so we're going to lunch." And he started talking to me about the fourth step. And I said, "Buddy, we're going a little fast for this, don't you think?" And he showed me in the book. He said, "Next, next, next." We launched on a course of vigorous action, and the next few pages talks about the fourth step and how we do it. And we got back, and he, ha he just happened to have a spiral notebook in his truck. And he opened it up and handed me a notebook says, Chris, start writing to people that you're pissed down. And we told you about that earlier. And I started working on a fourth step. And within two weeks, I've got a completed fourth step. I've done a, I've done a fear inventory and a little sex inventory. The difference is, guys, is we're just flat not making this a big, long process. Treatment centers gl glommed onto this because it takes, all oh, 30 days to work on. It gives you something to do when you're not doing anything else. You go work on that old fourth step. Oh, my God. You know, it's like some of us in here are going to have some a lot of resentments. And some of these, uh, we're just not going to have that many resentments. It doesn't make any difference. The cat in here with the most resentments is not doing the most successful fourth step. You're just evil to the freaking core. And what we're, I don't know. I don't know. Let's go. The, the deal is, is I, was, I would rather see you guys as my buddies. I'd rather see you deal with the top 10 resentments that's grinding your ass than to see you work six months trying to come up with somebody you haven't thought of in 40 years. Y'all understand? Because you're going to have to do some writing on this. Why put something on there that you're, this is an inventory. It's not therapy. Y'all with us? It's an inventory, not therapy. So you put the little names down. We're going, to, we're going to slide right across second column, what they did to us, how it affected us in the third column, victim, 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 fourth column. We stop. Now we stop looking at them, and we look at our shit, where we've been selfish and self-centered, where we've been dishonest and fearful. Y'all go, go follow? We can all see. If you can see a part that you played in that, even a little tiny part, you've been carrying it for 20 years, that that's your part. That's selfish to the core. Y'all understand that? Most of the time, if you're judging somebody, well, he's a bastard. You're, it's, anytime you're judging somebody, you could put selfish on there because that's what it is. Y'all understand? That's, we, we, we knock that out. As soon as I'm doing a fifth step with a guy, and as soon as I see my truth in that fourth column, I'm going next, next, get the next one. You with us? I stole that money from the store and they caught me. Yep, you see your part? Yeah, I stole the money. Next, I was molested as a child. Yep, you get across here, you see this, you see your part here? Yeah, you, you carried that, you didn't tell anybody, you, 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 the weight of the world. That, that was not your deal. Can you see the dishonesty because right? you didn't talk to anybody? Let somebody help you with that? Yeah, I sure can. Next, we go right next to the next one. We're not going to sit here and talk about this for two hours. Let a therapist do that. I just want to see you the truth in the fourth column so you can get free of this. If you don't get free, you can't help anybody else get free. 
it's all of this stuff in our lives, these, per, these perceptions, everybody's been out to get us. And the truth is, golly, I, I've just been a volunteer, you know. I mean, somebody said it earlier this morning, the, the, the nice lady that shared the deal. Guys, I'm going to be been a victim all my life. I can walk in the room of the absolute finest people in, work, in the earth, and I'll find the, the one psychopath, the borderline psychopath in the room. I'll find her. Walk over you to get to her back in the back. Oh, God. And I get to see this in my four step. Boom, boom, boom. You with this? I keep continue to do this. I do a little two column fear inventory, not eight columns, two columns. What's the fear? Why do you think you got it? I do an inventory around my sex. My sex inventory has got nothing to do with pokey pokey. It doesn't. Nowhere in the book does it say, give me every sort of detail about every position and every way that you did that. I don't, I mean, I've done fist steps like this. It's my behavior. How do I treat the opposite sex? Am I overly flirtatious? Am I, am I improper with you? Do I, don't answer that because because <laughs> I do sometimes. And I, but I look at this whole. I look at my behavior. If I was doing a proper four step, I could go down with any one of you women and do a fifth step with you, and that, 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 neither one of us would blush. It would be quite humbling. I've done fifth steps with women before, guys, and I got to tell you what. You think you're a big, big Don Juan stud? Sit across from another child of God, one of our sisters, and tell them how you've treated their sisters. It'll, that old, that old inventory goes pretty quick, you know. <laughs> We're not so interested in talking about all the little sort of details at that particular point. And I think that's pretty cool. I think that's pretty cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this stuff done. It's, guys, it shouldn't take. When I sit down with a guy, I'm going to give him a week. That's what I do with my guys. I'm sit down, we get up, we do a third step prayer. I'm going to give you a week to finish the steps. The, the, the fourth step. And then we're going to do a fifth step. I got my date planner out. I set it out. We're going to set up and we're going to do that. If you miss it, I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to reschedule within a couple of days. If you miss that, we're done. Bye bye. <laughs> go, go, go eat with the atheists because I, I don't have time to mess with you. I don't have my nothing. Y'all in? Okay. If you give the cat six months, he's going to take six months. You with us? Just finish it. Let me know when you're finished. You just well, that, that's, that's this 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 is coming from sponsors that just don't have time to mess with us. Y'all understand that? No, no, no. You're not. You can't possibly be finished. Take another six months because they don't want to have to sit and listen to this nonsense. But if you give them the instructions, it's going to be slow and quick. No, no fifth step should take longer than a few hours to do. If it's if it's a good healthy fifth step. Sitting there talking to a sponsor, one of your sponsees, when you're doing it, it shouldn't take longer than, even your first one, it shouldn't take longer than a few hours. Because we're not living in it. Y'all follow? We're going pretty quick. When you're doing a fifth step with me, I've got two pieces of paper in front of me. One paper's got eight step stuff on it. One paper's got six step on it. As I hear you share, I'm going to be writing your character defects down. Because I'm fixing to throw them back at you in a, in a few minutes. And I got the eight step list because the book says from our fifth step, we took the list of the people we owe amends to. You, you follow? So, and basically this gives us sponsors uh, something to do while we're trying not to fall asleep listening to your crap. <laughs> Some of you new guys, you don't know what I'm talking about. After you've heard a couple of fist steps, you've heard it all, guys. And that's like, I, that's our prayer. Please let me hear something cool this time. Because <laughs> this, this, this is truth. Uh, so you're sitting down and we get together and we, we usually I explain what we're going to do. And, and, and we sit down and we get this. And I'm going to go through it. I'm going to guide them through this fourth step, this fifth step process. And I'm going to hear their stuff. And if they're seeing their truth in the fourth column, we're going to move on and we're going to do fear and we'll do the little sex inventory. They'll follow. At the end of that, we're going to get close together. And I'm going to talk to them about these character defects because the book says that we're going to go away for an hour. And we're going to look over the, the, the first five proposals. Do I really understand the physical craving and the mental obsession? Do I really do I have any reservations about this guy? thing maybe that I need to talk about. Have I left something something out of that fist step that I need to share with that sponsor? And they usually come back, tell me about the chicken at that point, and we'll, then we move on. <laughs> maybe that's just a Texas thing. Who knows? <laughs> and, we, and, we, and we talk, and then I give them the information, and then, then they're going to get quiet for an hour. And I, sometimes I sit with them, and then they go into another room and get quiet, and sometimes... And I, I don't think it's, they're watching the clock. I don't know, 45 minutes. I don't know. I'll spend some time with it. And then at the end of the hour, they're going to do the seventh step. You guys can grind your teeth and go to these workshops all you want to. You know, I know what Bill Wilson says in the 12 and 12, you know, about this being the, the step that separates the men from the boys. It's two paragraphs. Guys, I don't know what to tell you. It's two paragraphs. I'm not the one that does the, the changing of my character defect. I go to God and ask him to remove the character defects. God, please, please help me not cuss from the podium as much as I used to. He's been successful with that. 
fairly successful. <laughs> you should have heard me five years ago. Come on, guys. You'd have been giving me a standing ovation at this point. Y'all understand? I'm, I'm painfully shy. Some of y'all that know me really well know how shy I am. And sometimes that shyness can get in the way. I want to scoot out the back and not get to know you. And it's, it can be a real awkward situation for me. I do okay here. But one-on-one, y'all have seen it. I said, are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah, God damn it. I'm just shy. You know, get out of my face. And I, and just, I don't know what to say. It's a character defect. If it stops me from getting to know you, I need to ask God to help me remove that. And I get to travel and I get to do some of this stuff to get around that. But it's a huge character defect for me. My judgmentalness, my, my freaking bigotry. Oh, my gosh. I'm a Texas boy raised by Texas people. I, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. If you ain't from Texas, you ain't nothing. And it's like, oh my gosh, and you're raised this way. And so you, so you hate everybody. You know, you got some, a bone to pick with everybody. I had to get past all that. That's, the, that's what the amends, that's what the six and seven are about. I do the six and seven step. And while we're doing that, uh, I, we get up and usually the next day I give them a break. And the next day I get together and we go over that eight step list. Make sense? Simple. Who do you owe amends to? Don't owe amends to everybody on earth. You just owe amends to some, some, some cats that you've harmed. And I help them sort it out on cards so we can figure out who they need to owe amends to. You don't want to go to somebody and say, I, I'm just sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so-. They know that. They'll, they'll point it out to you. I know you're very, very sorry. What are you sorry about? Money? Your behavior? What is it? And we're going to make sure you know that before you go in so you don't get ambushed in that room. The follow? There's a way to make every amend, guys. I'd be glad to talk to you about it any time. And, and there's no, no real excuse to not make most of these amends. And uh, I know what the book says. Uh, it didn't say, I'm not going to make the amends if it's going to cause me some discomfort. You follow? Because some of these amends are going to be tough. We always want to go to mom and dad. And they just love us. You don't know us anything. Just stay sober one day at a time. Thanks, mom. Appreciate that. <laughs> I forget, forget all the money I borrowed from you and all that. Thank you so much. You know, We want to go to the guy that slandered us all over town, and that's the guy that's going to be tough. We go start making the amends. The book says while we clean up the records of our past, we start practicing the disciplines of 10, 11, and 12. It talks to us about that. This is the place where you, we lose you. We lose you in the, in the fourth step because you're working on it that you're not working on, and we lose you in the amends process. I can't go work with others because I'm not finished with my amends. I hear that till the cows come home. You with us? W- the rubbish, great word y'all use. And that's exactly what it means. Start making those guiding amends, and then let's start working with others. You with us? Continue to take personal inventory during the days. When I, when I screw up, I'm going to clean it up. And I do my inventories at night. In the mornings, I wake up, reflection. What am I doing? Am I, am I saying what I'm, what I'm going to do? And then following through with that. Prayer and meditation, I start practicing that. And I go, and I go find a drunk. Everybody that I work with has to have a service commitment from day one. I, I don't, you can milk this for one day if you want to. You can sit over there and cry and sling snot. You can do whatever you, one day I'm going to let you do that. And after that, you can do that from behind the coffee bar. Or you can go with me outside and we're going to pick up cigarette butts. Y'all understand how many meetings we can't meet in anymore, how many churches we're not allowed in anymore because the stupid cigarette butts have been flipped out in the yard. And that's what we do at our groups. We, we walk around, we, 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 we do cigarette butt duty. We go pick that stuff up. And that's okay. Everybody that I get to work with, that's exactly what we're going to do. After that, guys, what we're going to do, my job as a sponsor is to hold you accountable. I'm going to pay attention to what you're doing. If I see you being goofy, then we're going to get down with that. In the next hour, we're going to talk specifically about some of this stuff. But, but one of the accountability things we're going to watch out for real close is that accountability, the, the, the commitments. Are you going to have a job? No free rides. Go follow Biggest mistake we make, biggest mistake we make in this 12-step stuff is this idea that you haven't been sober long enough to do the work. It's just stupid. It is ra- it's, just, it's just rampant all over the world. You can't sponsor until you've been sober a year. Well, I don't see that written anywhere, and I don't think Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob quite understood that. <laughs> you don't understand? And everybody gets mad when you bring that analogy up to them, but, but things are different today. <laughs> no, they're not. What kept Bill Wilson sober was working with drunks. They didn't stay sober necessarily, but but he stayed sober. You know, follow? Everybody gets to go work. Again, we read it last night. Page 129 in the book, it gets real crystal clear. In those first days of convalescence, we're supposed to go help somebody. You want to get out of your head? You want to start feeling better? Go work with a drunk. Any way you can. You'll follow? 
watched a couple of little guys picking up trash in here earlier. Little guys, I don't know if they were a part of this thing and this, this committee to put this thing on or whatever, but just picking up stuff, just cleaning up, straightening it up. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. That's a part of the thank you. That's the service work that we're talking about. It doesn't necessarily have to be sitting down with somebody with a big book. Get off your ass and do something for somebody. You don't want to even do it in AA? Go to a nursing home. Go, go, go find an old guy to play dominoes with. They all cheat. Let me just tell you, going in the door. <laughs> Every every one of them cheats. Good gosh, let me just it just drives me absolutely nuts. In New York in two thousand, Intergroup uh, uh, they put this article out in box four five nine. Some of y'all have heard me talk specifically about it. There's the misconceptions with this whole thing. Um, the most frustrating thing about answering Intergroup's phones. Uh, says Bob R., manager of the Intergroup Association in New York City, is finding an AA member willing to take a 12-step call for some sick alcoholic who has phoned us for help. We've got these guys, these little Pollyanna guys all over our fellowship saying, everything's okay in AA, everything's just fine, everything's just the way it's supposed to be. No, it's not. If the main problem in New York is finding to find somebody that wants to do, go do a 12-step call, we got problems. Sometimes it takes us up to 20 calls to identify just one willing volunteer. Some of the responses we hear when a live member actually does answer the phone. What's a 12-step call? <laughs> Piss poor sponsorship, that. How did you get my phone number? <laughs> you gave it to us. Do you mean you actually want me to talk to someone who's still drinking? The saddest response uh, came from a member who exclaimed, No, I can't do it. I'm busy all day. Today is my sobriety anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> that boy's going to hell. You know that? I mean, <laughs> oh, why do I bring it? I read it every time we talk about sponsorship and understand because it's perfectly okay. We, 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 look, we look the other way while people act like this. Everybody in this room has got the same responsibilities to get, get folks well. A buddy of mine sent me this email from California. He'd, he'd been out for a long time, had sober a bunch of years, and then come back into the fellowship, head and worked the steps. And he, he got this new guy to sponsor him. I found a sponsor that had me read Bill's story for an entire month of May. Is there anything wrong with reading Bill's story for an entire month of May? I, it, I'm, no, I don't guess there is. As long as you're doing some of this other crap, I'm going to have you through the steps in 30 days, but you're going to be reading Bill's story. Oh, and by the way, let me look real quick in here and see if I can find where it says if you read Bill's story, you'll stay sober. I'll get back to you on that one. When he announced he was leaving for vacation and for a month and a half, my instructions were to read the doctor's opinion over and over till he got back. <laughs> I'm not even going to read the rest of it. Y'all know where it's going, right? Okay, but what gives this right, this guy the, the right to sponsor like that? Well, I sponsor different. I have my men read every line of the big book. How cool is that? But again, this is triage. While he's reading, trying to struggle through and making his little mind laugh, he hasn't made his amends. He's not doing his inventory. He still feels like a worthless piece of crap. And we can give him the instructions on what to do, but we're not going to do that. Why? Let me tell you why. Because selfish and self-centeredness is the root of our problems. And as long as I've got you stuck reading a bunch of the literature in the book and just spinning your wheels, I don't have to mess with you. Why don't you just say, I don't have time to sponsor you. And flip him to somebody that does. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't take a chance on killing somebody by giving him a bunch of assignments. It drives me crazy when people call me. I need a new sponsor. Can you give me some assignments? <laughs> yeah. Go work with a drunk. Oh, yeah, I know that. But no, you're not hearing me. You, you want some written stuff to do. You want, you want some exercises to make you feel good about yourself, to make you feel a part of. You want to know what will make you feel part of? Go get a drunk. Go find somebody to work with. The book says we try to go do this. This is the 12th step. I'm going to end with this real quick. We'll go take a quick break and we'll come back. Well, I'm going to finish this thing up. The book says we tried to carry this message. That doesn't mean we sit in an AA hall and play cards and watch the door every once in a while to see if there's any newcomers coming in. That means we go hustle. We go to the detox centers. We go, we go out there looking for some drunks. We're not out there with a net trying to drag them in. But if we think that they need to be here, we're going to sit down and we're going to spend the time that we need to, to help them. You'll follow? That's how we stay sober. Y'all go smoke quick and come back.
how, how, how bad could it be? Never, don't answer that. It's going to go quick. Y'all have been absolutely wonderful. Some of the, um, well, I think one of the key secrets that they didn't teach me, I guess I need to introduce myself again for the people that are just coming in. My name is Chris Raymer. I'm a very grateful recovered alcoholic. Um, the, one of the uh, most closely guarded secret is this right here in the, the tradition that talks about says we have but one primary purpose and to understand that I, uh, I've been so blessed by Alcoholics Anonymous and the fellowship and the and the, in, the the information I've gotten from my membership if I have any problem in the world I don't care if it's stock market problem or, or my truck breaks down or, or I have a girl problem whatever I can find a solution for it in this meeting I mean this fellowship is absolutely unbelievable but my primary purpose is is to go work with a drunk that's my job and if I'm doing that everything's going to be okay make sense? nobody gets off the hook though everybody gets a chance to do it <clears throat> I want to mention real quick, cover a couple of items uh, that I make sure that my little newcomers, my little protégés understand when I get them. After I qualify them and we start them working through the steps, I'm I'm up to my butt in in these next items. There's not very many of them because it's just not that complicated. Again, about accountability, I'm going to ask uh, my little uh, newcomer to be as honest with me as they can be. Y'all follow? I think um, there's no uh, extent of... Uh, the damage that one little piece of dishonesty can do. My dishonesty in one area over here is going to absolutely screw me over here. Y'all, can y'all get around, around of that? What goes around comes around. And so what I have to do, I'm asking people to get really honest with me early on in sobriety, especially about any goofiness that goes on. I'm not your, I'm your confidant, I'm your buddy, and I'm not going to try to fix you, but I want you to get honest about this business. You're, you're padding your expense check over here. It doesn't hurt anybody. That company's got more money than Carter's got pills. I understand it, but it's going to hurt you because if you can justify cheating your company, pretty soon you're going to justify cheating your wife or your kids or yourself. Guys, we're not always going to do this perfect. But if I've got enough people around me to hold me accountable, oh my gosh, it's just the bomb. Y'all follow? I know some people in this fellowship that just got one or two friends and that's all. Man, not me. I, I, we, we laugh at Patty. She's got a Facebook page. and I mean, I, I couldn't cheat on her if I wanted to. I mean, you guys, everybody in the world would, would holds me accountable. And how cool is that? I I love her to death. She wants to come next time. I want everybody to get really honest. One of the things that I want you to get honest with me about as a protege is your medications. I'm going to get this into this and out of this real quick. I preface it. I talked about it earlier. I'm not a doctor, and I'm not going to sit there and tell you what to do one way or another. But I've watched so many people uh, jam themselves up and relapse continually around the dishonesty in these medications. You follow? The doctors will prescribe whatever you want. If you're feeling anxious, they will give you something to make you less anxious. And we also know that it will also cause you to relapse. If you're taking a benzodiazepine, you will not stay sober. It's liquor and a pill. That shit got quiet, didn't it? No, did you see it? Did you hear did you hear it? I'm just telling I'm not saying you're not sober. I'm saying I'm not gonna work with you if you're taking benzodiazepines. And I don't care who prescribed it. You can't not drink and take those medications for very long. All right? I'm not a doctor. I'm saying straighten it out. There's got to be another way that you can do this. My question is, especially in the conversations with the newcomers, guys, I've got a question. Why are you taking it? Why are you feeling so anxious? Could it be that you haven't finished the 12 steps, that you've got some crap going on you haven't dealt with? Y'all, y'all understand it? Is there a little piece of dishonesty that's floating around that's keeping you awake? Is that why you can't uh, get, you know, some of you, I'm watching, talking to a guy earlier. I don't know. I just seem anxious all the time. He's got one of those great big coffees. Like he's got to hold it with two hands, you know, it's like this. <laughs> that's me. Y'all understand it? That's, a, that's And you wonder why you're on edge all the time. Buddy, this is just a chemical reaction. It's called <laughs> caffeine. Quit drinking it. Y'all understand? Then you won't have to take these medications. Anyway, I want you to get honest with me about the antidepressants that you're taking. I'm not against the antidepressants. I just think so many people, they're, are, they're painfully overprescribed. And most people at Alcoholics Anonymous who are working the 12 steps don't need to be on them. But I'm just, that's just my opinion. I've, just, I've been, on, been on them for almost my adult life. The, uh, the side effects of those medications are horrendous. And some of you haven't taken them long enough to experience those side effects. But... but but anything that possible side effects is anal, leak, anal, anal leakage, I, I have to question whether I want to take those medications. You want to talk about depressed? Oh, my God. 
absolute honesty is what we're going to try to talk to the guys. One of the things that I work with the newcomers about real quick in there is I talk about meeting etiquette. And a lot of y'all have talked to me about that. So meeting etiquette is that we teach. It's my job to teach you as a newcomer how to behave in a meeting. We don't just turn these folks loose. Y'all follow? I had a sponsor. I'm going to tell you what. This guy was right here next to me. He showed me how to chair a meeting. He showed me what was appropriate. And I had a girl in that, in that club that I got sober in. And she, buddy, she cleaned me up like a big dog. That way, buddy, you, you pay attention to your language. Again, I, I, I laugh about it all the time because I used to catch such a bad rap because I said the F word so much from the podium. And it was, it really was a bonding experience with me and the, and the 13 year olds in the room. You know, I was, a, I was, I was quite effective with the, with the kids, but you know, the adults, they don't have to listen to that nonsense. It was so funny. I was in a, uh, doing a little lead in a, in a little group over in Texas uh, a couple of weeks ago and, and, uh, they went around the room sharing and, uh, three of them, they couldn't not say it. Every other word was the F word. And one of the girls, it was brand new. She, she'd come in and she, cause she picked up a little desire chip. She was brand new in there. She it was her second meeting and she had her little nine year old daughter in there with her. The little daughter was sitting there playing with her cell phone and they're getting, you know, and, and, but everybody was just oblivious. To the fact that this newcomer had her kid in there and they wouldn't stop saying, I can say anything I want in AA. No, you can't. Not if I'm sponsoring you, you can't. Because if you're harming somebody by your behavior, you're going to relapse. Y'all understand this? Is it a pain in the ass to stop to try to watch your language and pay attention? Yes. Are we going to do it perfect? Of course not. Sometimes there's no other way to say it than that. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you just got to say it. But wake up. Pay attention to what's around you. We, get, we catch a bad rap about it. It's about etiquette. It's just about etiquette. As a newcomer, if you're a guy and I'm sponsoring you, I'm going to ask you to dress accordingly when you come into a meeting. Casual. Casual chic is okay. Uh, that old work shirt with your hairy armpits hanging out and those old blown out cutoffs with your goobers hanging out. And that, no. No. I know you think you look cool, but the little newcomer across the table is freaking out. I'm not going to address the women. Like I said, I don't care what you wear. That's uh, not, none of my business. Pay attention, guys. It's etiquette. Bill Wilson, Dr. Bob has supposedly said it. Carry the message. And if you must, use words. So, so when I'm going into a meeting, I want to try to be as nice as I can. From the podium, I try to try to look r relatively presentable. I don't get up there and cut off some flip-flops and an old busted-out T-shirt to share how God has blessed my life. I just don't. You with us? Do it any way you want. I'm, these are not. It's not in the big book. I'm just coming from what, what's what's helped us. It's called respect for the fellowship. Yeah, respect for the fellowship. One of the biggest problems that we have in Alcoholics Anonymous, I know in some of the other fellowships too, is this thing called punctuality. Y'all have been so good about it, it's not even funny. You freak me out. But nine times out of ten, what happens in meetings is like you got my guys when they're when I'm working with them, that's one of the first things they're gonna do is they're gonna learn what to do. You're gonna get there on time, get ahead of time, get your coffee, you with us? And if you have a little bowel problem, you know, you got a little 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 something something going on there, then sit in the close to the door. You follow? Come on time and then sit. This drives me crazy. When you come to a guiding meeting, you can't sit for 45 minutes after we read how it works and all this, and you can't sit for 45 minutes an hour. You got to get up three times to get coffee and twice to go pee and once to go smoke and come back. Well, just stay out next time. Because every time you get up and slip by the podium, the speaker stops what he's saying, loses his train of thought. The little kid, We don't have enough time for that nonsense. You don't want to be there? Go away. You don't have the respect to show up on time. Sometimes, come on, guys, we're going to be late sometimes. I understand that. Be respectful about it. Don't clump up to the front, take your assigned seat, and disturb everybody because you couldn't get your ass in gear and come to a meeting on time. That, yeah? Listen, got quiet again. <laughs> this is about respect. Again, meeting etiquette. I want everybody to contribute. The guys that I sponsor, I'm going to do them the same way they did me. 23 years ago, you're going to get a job in Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're sitting in this room right now and you don't have a job, and a lot of you don't, I guarantee you, that's okay. Let's get one. You go find something that you're good at in this program. It doesn't mean that you got to you got to be a sponsor monster or whatever, but go make coffee. Go go do the artwork. Go set up. Get on a committee for a conference. Go. Are you going to do something to give back to this this program? 
Again, I got to say this. We're going to talk about it before this is over. But I feel a real sense of responsibility. The, 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 the original folks. We got some people in here that've been sober a long time. All I can say is thank you for staying. But I owe you something. I owe you the same the same dedication that you gave this program. And I'm going to continue to do the same thing. Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob. Can you all imagine how many people died putting this thing together before we got the big book in, in 1939? Between 35 and 39, how many hundreds of alcoholics did did we kill by doing this? wrong. I mean, these guys figured it out. Little brother said it in the, in, in the sharing. God dang, you can't not feel that responsibility. And you think you've got a free ride? You're, you're, you're missing the whole, the, the whole gravy of this. You're going to work through the 12 steps. And I got to tell you guys, the, 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 the minute you get finished with these steps, the minute you're working on these amends, you're, it's time to go look for a drunk. The guys that I'm sponsoring, by the time they're six months, if they're not sponsoring anybody, we're going to have the talk. You know, I don't, the talk doesn't involve firing them, but it's going to be a talk. And no, we're not going to have a conversation. I'm going to do all the talking. This is not a democracy. This is a guiding dictatorship at this point. Y'all follow? Because I'm going to ask you the questions. Who in the hell do you think you are to come in these rooms and sit and take? You've been taker all your life. I had a guy jam me one time right after I got sober, sitting in a guiding meeting. He said, Chris, we don't have a chairperson. Would you chair? I says, no, I'm, I'm not sober long enough to chair. I don't feel comfortable doing that. He looked at me. You, What? You you don't feel comfortable doing that. Hmm. That's all he said. He was a printer from Oklahoma. Hmm. And he chaired it, and after the meeting, I went up to try to talk to him, and he ignored me. He walked around me. Y'all understand? Next Saturday, I chaired the meeting. <laughs> Somebody else wanted to, and I said, nope, this is mine. And I chaired the meeting. Was it scary? Yes. Did I screw it up? Yes. Did they laugh at me? Yes. Did I say what I would do and did I participate? Yeah. That's how you'll start feeling a part of this fellowship. Can y'all see that? One of the things that I ask folks to do in Alcoholics Anonymous with the guys I sponsor, one of the main things that I do is that I, I try to explain anonymity to them. I'm going to hit it real lightly. Anonymity is a spiritual foundation. That means that if you're a, a, a big shot, you don't come in here and try to use your big shotism to get anywhere in this program. We're all bozos on this bus. You follow? Chris Raymer, a little circuit speaker. Yeehaw, who cares? <laughs> I'm just a drunk like everybody else. Don't ever try to make me something that I'm not. That's a bad place to put speakers on, on a pedestal, sponsors, people in the group. Don't put anybody on a pedestal because we're all bozos. That's one of the things you'll know. That's how you'll know you're having a spiritual experience, folks, is when you walk into a room and realize that you're not better than anybody in there and you're not worse than anybody in there. You just want to cry because I was always better than you or worse than you. And that's the spiritual experience right there, guys. Anonymity, guys, the problem that we're having today is that we're, we're Dr. Bob talked about practicing a, below and above the tradition. And some of you cats in this room are so anonymous, you're useless. Absolutely useless. My name's Mike R., and I'm an alcoholic. Great, Mike. If I happen to get drunk tonight and needed to call you, how can I find you? Well, look up, up my car. Well, but you're anonymous. You're not on the meetings list and nobody knows your last name. How am I going to find you? Well, this is anonymous program. This is anonymous. You, you, you are useless and you're a loser. And I don't care who I pissed off. At the group level, we should not be anonymous from each other. And this is why some of you guys don't feel connected. This is why some of you cats don't feel connected because you're so anonymous. I got circle triangles on the, my bicycles, circle triangles on the back of my pickup trucks because I want people to know that I'm in a program. I can't tell you how many times I walked out of Walmart and walked back. Patty says, oh, shit, there's somebody sitting on your truck. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why my life is so full because while you get in there and finish returning your calls, I'm going to talk to me a brand new drunk because they saw the circle triangle. Usually there's somebody in the program. They're coming back from a relapse. They saw the circle triangle and wanted to talk to somebody. Oh, I'm anonymous. I don't want anybody to know that I'm in the greatest program, the greatest fellowship that ever existed on the face of the earth. I'm so anonymous. <laughs> 
If I walk out of this conference, guys, I want you to know, and I introduce myself with last name because I want you to be able to call me. I give you my cards. We're not drumming business. I want you to, t- to touch base with me if you need me. For no other reason, it's going to help me stay sober. That's, that's how this works. If I walk out and they've got a camera out there and the, and the locals are taking pictures and they want to talk, my name is Chris R. I'm a recovered alcoholic. I'm not going to give them my last name. At the level of press, radio, and films, we're anonymous. I don't do promotions. I don't do deals where they videotape and use last names and that stuff gets out. But guys, in the meetings, please. I had a friend of mine about six months sober have a heart attack and went to the hospital and all of us rushed down to see him and make sure he was okay. And we, what room is Wayne R in? <laughs> they said, are you family? Of course, we all lied. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's his last name? And I'm... And not a one of us knew his last name. Yo, know, that's bullshit. That's just absolute crap. That's that's absolute crap. We talk about anonymity, guys, and that's basically what the deal is. Share your uh, uh, break your anonymity with your pharmacist. Break your anonymity with your doctor and your dentist. Y'all understand that? The dentists are the number one culprits these days. Bless their hearts. We love them. We all come to the fellowship with banged up teeth, you know, and we get a little money. We we go fix our teeth, but we don't bother to tell them they're, we're in recovery. I and mean, we're sitting there gleeful. God dang! I got on Friday. I get to go get my wisdom teeth pulled out. He, you know, like what's up with this, buddies? Because you're fixing to get a bunch of meds. You with us? My doctor knows I'm in recovery, and if I need meds, I'd listen. He gives me he gives me three pills. He's under the impression. I don't care what kind of surgery we're doing on my mouth. He's going to give me three pills. I take one there at night. I wake up the next day. If there's still pain, I can take one more, and that's it. I've never taken the third pill. You'd be amazed at how much pain relief you're going to get from aspirin. But I can't tell you how many of you guys I picked up off the side of the street drunk because of a, a dentist prescription. Oh, good. Look, thirty hydrocodone. You had a a, a filling redone. What? You got 30 hydrocodone? What are you, uh, the little dope head from hell? What? <laughs> I get transparent with all those folks, including my families. I don't want my family to know I'm in the program. You're going to die. Jesus. I, you, that means you're never going to go make amends to those people. Break your anonymity. I want you to stay print transparent about the meds. doesn't mean that we're not going to take meds. I just want you to stay transparent. Get honest about all the other nonsense. Again, we talked about it. It's, Sex checks is what we drink around. Y'all understand? That's just historic. Get honest about all that nonsense. You're going to get the commitment. I want you to attend specific meetings. I have the right to ask you which meetings to go to. I'm not going to stress meetings. As a fellowship, we need to stop stressing meetings as a solution for alcoholism. Well, I don't know what you're going to do, but I want you to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. Why? We got people staying away from the fellowship they just because they got lives they just can't do that and we got press out there taking shots at us because that's all that's the best we can come up with y'all understand that they have this thing out now in California they have these big things called sober coaches where they follow you around and that's one of their big lead-ins because some of us have important busy lives we can't afford to go to a meeting every day so you pay this guy three hundred dollars unless you want him to, to sleep with him too and then you can pay him extra. <laughs> Unbelievable. To leave it to the Americans. I mean, this is just absolutely crazy. And these guys can follow you around and knock the beer out of your hand and keep you away from a crack pipe and all that kind of nonsense. They're called, they're called, they're called sober, so, sober coaches. You all understand that? But it's the lead-in that I'm trying to get you guys to see because some of us have busy, important lives. Listen, is anybody in here that doesn't have a busy, important life? But the idea you got to be in a... Yeah, I know. We'll get you a job later, brother. Don't worry about that. We'll help you out. But the problem is, is what we end up with is that we end up with this idea that that's all we're about. That's how why people think we're a cult. Well, you got to go to a meeting every day. No, you don't. Y'all understand that? How, how many of y'all remember? Uh, uh, y'all probably did. Did y'all read Wired magazine a c- couple of months ago and had that big article about alcoholism? And it's big leading with this this idiot. I'd love to find out who it is. I hope he gets a copy of this tape. This idiot in New York. <laughs> It's, it's, they're they're going to have to close the meetings down because the because the blizzards are coming and they're going to and they're not going to be able to open the building so they're not going to have a meeting. Oh my God, the panic! I don't know what I'm going to do. I won't be able to go to a meeting tomorrow. What will we do? What will we do? They made us look like idiots. And this guy says, I don't know what y'all are going to do, but I guarantee you, I'll find a meeting someplace. Oh my God! Really? Y'all understand what I'm saying here? Um, why, why are we stressing that? Why the, the importance of that? I, I love the fellowship. I go to about three meetings a week. When I got sober, I was in a meeting about five times a week. I had nothing else to do. I just It was just a social entity that I went to. It was just okay. Then I got married. Then I got a job. Then I got some responsibilities. You see, you've got babies. You can't go every day, some of you. You follow? Stop trying to. 
I'd rather see you go two or three meetings a week that you absolutely loved and that you're involved in and a part of than to go to a meeting every day in a, in a zombie-like stare marking off the calendar. Well, I made another meeting. Big deal. They'll follow what I'm saying? Some of you flat don't agree, but that's okay. I get my guys. I'm going to tell them specifically what to go. And the guys that I'm going to sponsor, they're not going to go to open discussion meetings for the first few months they're sober. I don't care how many meetings they want to go to, but this open discussion hell is, is not going to be for my guys. They're going to go to literature-based meetings only, and they're going to share. You newcomers don't have anything to share. That's not what my big book says. You with us? There's enough wisdom in this room is with people under a year sober to, to, to change the world. You have every right to share. Make sense? But you don't have to share very long. <laughs> that's, that's part of AA etiquette. I'm telling these guys specifically what to do. Y'all understand that, guys? If you don't have any experience, they're talking about the four step and the step study meeting, and you've never done a four step quite yet, then you don't have anything. When it comes around to say, I pass. I haven't done a four step yet. I can't. I just. I'm, my skin crawls when I get somebody. To, well, I haven't done a four step yet. But this is what I think it would be about. I don't want to hear your opinions. Don't want to hear your thoughts. I want to hear your experience. If you haven't done it, shut up. Let's let's move on. My guys like that. They understand that. Everybody I sponsor understands the three minute rule. Not five minutes. Three minutes. You're going to share for three minutes. Period. We have a timer in my AA group. We got a little timer. Beep, beep, beep. You can hear it go off, and then you're going to start. Go. And then you're going to, and you're going to talk. At three minutes, you're going to hear a little beep, 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 beep. That means shut up. That means you said everything you're going to say, because now we're going to get to hear the little brother sitting next to you, because he's going to share some good stuff, too, for three minutes. Come on, guys. It's another form of selfish and self-centeredness. you got 60 people sitting in a goddamn meeting, and three people take up the whole meeting. Who in the hell do you think you are? Oh, I just I didn't intend to share it all. And now look, I've talked for 30 minutes. We're out there. You hear this bang. Somebody shot themselves in the back of the room. Listen to this. Everybody gets a chance to share. Everybody gets a chance to share. Yeah. That bell ringing system is worldwide wide now, guys. That was another one of those great articles in the grapevines. One of the few that were good. So y'all y'all enact that stuff. One of the things I'm going to ask the newcomer to do, and I'm going to move on, is stay in all three parts. We had the circle triangle. We had the little rubber stamp that we did. We're going to stay in all three parts of the program, and I explain that to them. There's the fellowship. That's the meeting. And there's the program. That's the 12 steps. And the service work is the third piece of that, and that's what you're going to do. So I'm going to hold you accountable. Every time you're having trouble staying sober, any of you guys, I've talked to some of my brothers and sisters that are just coming back from a relapse, open up the front of your book, look at the circle triangle, and tell me what part of the circle triangle you're not in because that's why you relapsed. Don't tell me about the girl. That's a cop-out, and that's a lie. I don't care how she broke your heart because we got people in this room right now that are having their hearts broken today. They're not even, second, not even given a drink a second thought. That's because they're all three parts of the program. Is that, y'all are clear on that? I'm not minimizing that. Well, let's talk about the girl. I, which, let's, we'll talk about that. But, but let's don't blame her for the relapse because that's not true. That death didn't cause you to relapse. Losing that job didn't cause you to relapse. You can get mad at me about this if you want to, folks. I love you. But don't hide in the delusion that there's a justification for your victimization. We're all going to hurt. Let's get together and hug. Let's get together and talk about it. Drink some coffee. Good gosh. Let me, let, me, let me help you get through this. But the obsession to use will never come back if you stay in all three parts of that program. And that's my promise to you. That was the promise they made me. And it's, it's, it's proved to be true. Again, your drink is not connected to your external world. I'm going to wind this down. If um, I said it earlier this morning... If sitting in a meeting talking about my day would feel as good as sitting in a room watching one of my guys that I sponsor light up like a neon sign because he's having a spiritual experience, then I just shut up. I, I, I wouldn't travel ever again. I just stay home in my garden. But, but there's so many people, my friends in here, that are that are not feeling connected to the program. That are not feeling connected to God. And that's not okay with me. It's not okay. It's life. We ebb and flow to the connection. We're not always going to be on a spiritual mountaintop. But it's not okay to stay there. And there's a reason that we are in that spot. 
when we start to get sick again, what little brother was talking about, this untreated alcoholism, when it starts to come back, and it can come back any time. sad part is we see a lot of people with long-term sobriety, and it all of a sudden comes up in broad, broad sense. I did okay for six or seven years, and all of a sudden my life went to shit. D- did your life go to shit, or did you go to shit? Because sometimes my perception is, 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 is what's killing me. It's, I've still got the same problems I had 23 years ago. Y'all understand that? But my perception has changed because I try to stay spiritually connected. So what they tried to explain to me in early days when I got sober, and they explained those pages on 14 and 15 about the necessity to grow spiritually by working with others, they said, Chris, that that includes you. That means everybody in here. It's scary to think about sponsorship. And everybody wants to push it away. One of the main reasons is we think we got to take these people on to raise. One of the biggest misconceptions about sponsorship is, is that if you ask me to sponsor you, I'm responsible for you, that I'm going to take you on to raise. And that for every little problem and for the rest of my life, you're going to call me with every little detail, you know. And it's like if you set this relationship up like that, that's what it's going to be. Some of you in here right now have sponsees that you've allowed to monopolize, uh, monopolize your life, that they're, they're so, you're, you're, you're too enmeshed. But you set the ball rolling by asking them to call you every day. You've allowed them to do this. The book gets crystal clear. It says, when I start placing my dependence on you instead of God, I'm screwed. But we've got these cats in our fellowship that want to set themselves up as the guru, all-knowing answer man. Come to me with everything. And i got to tell you guys, that's doing a damage to our fellowship. One, because you can't possibly sponsor as many people as you need to sponsor if you take them on to raise like this. My brother talks about it better than anybody. He said, when you've got little kids, I'm watching some of you with babies, and it's just, it's, just, it's just laser intensity. You're talking, but you're watching the baby. You know, it's just early on in sobriety, that's what we got to do with our little ones. That's what we got to do with our protégés. You're watching them continually. It's time-consuming. But guys, 30 days later, we've done a fifth step, the big time-consuming. I've worked you through the amends. You're making the amends, and now you're starting to look around and start to sponsor. If I've got to watch you on a daily basis like that, then something's wrong. I used to call my sponsor on the goddamn phone and talk to him like that. You're not going to believe what she did. He said, eh, eh, wait, 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 have you prayed about it? No, but listen, i got to tell you, you know, the same thing we were talking about the other day. Here she did, <laughs> dial tone. <laughs> Click in a dial tone. But Mark, it was, it was wonderful. Do you all understand that? Because that was his deal. Have you talked to God about it? Because I want your dependence on God. Because God's going to show you what to do. Do you need to stay in that relationship? I, I don't know. I've never walked a day in your shoes. It's easy for me to stand up here and pontificate to you and tell you what you need to do with your life, with your job, with your money, with your health. I've never walked a day in your shoes. I don't know anything about you, but I'm going to tell you what I think you should do. Shame on us. I'm going to bend over backwards to try to get you spiritually connected so that that power can tell you what to do. Knowing what to do, guys, I'm going to tell you something. Knowing God's will and doing God's will are two different things. There's a bunch of you sitting in here right now that know exactly what to do, and you're scared to do it. I know. Me too. And I'm going to, I'm going to hug you, and I'm going to encourage you, and we're going to walk through it together because that's how we stay sober. Because if you're not happy, joyous, and free, it's your shit. It's your stuff. Because I know people sitting in this room right now with cancer that are happy, joyous, and free because they choose to be. They're not playing the victim card. They got a bunch of protégés they're working with, and that's the, the highlight of their life. Walk through, walk through. Yeah. You got a brand new car out in the parking lot, you want to tell me how great life is? That's good. Come in with a bad prostate examination and talk to me about how good life is. And I'll show you the power of God. It's called gratitude. I'm grateful for every day, guys. It's perfect today. A little jet laggy, but it's perfect. Tomorrow might not be, but I'm going to be okay. Because this ain't about Chris Raymer. This is about God. That's my job. I help them and I guide them. And if I don't have the experience, I'm going to flip them to you because you've got the experience. And if I in over my head, somebody wants to talk to me about post-traumatic stress. I don't know. But I know a bunch of people in the fellowship that do. And I network with that. And I know a bunch of counselors. And I know a bunch of therapists. And I know a bunch of doctors. you got problems. I'm not going to try to be your lawyer. I'm not going to be your, your counselor, your marriage guidance, life coach. Horse shit. I've got one. I'll say it again. One primary purpose. 
And that's to carry the message to the newcomer. My job is to get you connected to God, period. It's not to fix your life. We've got to, we've got to step back and stop trying to be junior therapists for everybody in the world because we're failing miserably at it. Again, I'll say it and move on. If you're depending on me to fix you, you're not going to depend on God. You follow? We don't chase drunks. If they're not interested in doing what we want to do, we go, bye-bye. Have a nice life. Let's go eat a hamburger. I'm not going to fire you. I'm going to suggest that perhaps you could go call Joy because maybe she could help you more than me. Because obviously what I'm offering you, you don't want. But I'm not going to waste my time on somebody that doesn't want to do this work. Exact description in the big book about what to do. It said, pass them on to somebody else. I love you. You'll always be a friend. But I obviously can't help you. Make sense? We don't take them on to raise, pat them on the butt, let them go find somebody else to work with, let them go find a drunk. I'll say this, guys. You walk into an AA club sometimes in a meeting and you listen. The other night I did it. I was like, we were laughing about it. I went to, to early to make coffee at the AA club in Ingram and I heard somebody talking in the back room and I stuck my head around and one of the guys I'm sponsoring, little old, old country guy, this guy's as country as the day is long. And I don't want to make fun of him from the podium, but, but I will. This guy is so absolutely... <laughs> This guy is so absolutely country to the core. Anyway, I didn't think he was going to be able to get this deal, but he said he'd do what he'd do anyway. We got him through the work, and he's starting to do it. He's got him a little protege. The other night, at the end of our meeting, they says, is anybody ready to sponsor? Raise your hand. And, and I'm looking over at him like this, and I'm just, I, I just, and he said, Raise. He, he got it about that high up like that, and, and they beat the door down because this little guy had shared pretty good in the meeting, and, and, and he, he, the meeting was over, and he was swamped like a bunch of swaths around him. You know? And then he's looking over there like, what do I do? What do I do? It was the coolest to watch. You know? just, but he got his first little protege. But anyway, I'm in there making coffee, and I look around the corner like that because I hear this old guy's talking. That old, you, you can't miss his, his, his voice. And I'm looking over there like that, and he's got this book open, and he's sitting in that meeting at the chair where I, where I did the work with him, and he's sitting in that meeting, and he's got his finger pointed at this guy nose and said, listen, God dang, pay attention. I want you to mark this. In. Where's your highlighter? I thought I told you to bring your highlighter. <laughs> oh, it was so beautiful. I mean, it was just like me. And I stood back because I didn't want to interrupt like that. And I stood back and I'm listening to this, you know, and this guy is sharing with the same passion and the same zeal, his spiritual experience with this new guy. You with us? And then this guy, he was, you want to talk about tough. This guy was like nails with this guy. I'm starting to think, God dang, what have we created here? A monster, you know, a little stuff. Listen, but I'm sitting there making coffee with tears in my eyes because here I am, I get the witness. Absolutely, again, the miracle of this. Somebody took time to give me the message, and I turned around and give the message to a few guys, and they turn around and give the message. We, we talk about it all the time. We said it this morning. We spent all of our goddamn time talking about all the damage. Let's, let's talk about all the shit storm we stirred up out there because we were drinking and drugging. Just think today, right now, how many lives have been affected just simply because you're not drinking or drugging today. Forget how the quality of your sobriety. The simple fact that you're not putting those substances in your body. How many people in your family have been affected? At work have been affected? In your communities that have been affected? How can you make light of that? And here it is, one to another. Bill Wilson, Dr. Bob, that lineage is so straight, straight down to us. What are we going to do? Shrug? Give them a little cycle babble? Dust them off for somebody else? Or are we going to take our rightful place in the trench? You don't want to do it? Go away. We got enough people sitting on the sideline to choke a horse. Half the people in our service structure, all they want to do is take shots at everybody else out there. Oh, you can't do that. Oh, you can't do that. That's against, you can't do that. Why don't you shut up? Why don't you tell me why we can't? And that's why I stay in trouble with the service structure. And I'm not knocking. I'm loving them. I'm in the service structure. I, res I'm re I respect that. But guys, understand our one primary purpose of what we're supposed to be doing here. Don't make it tougher for somebody to carry the message because you want to get in split hairs because you didn't chair the group conscience the way it was supposed to be chaired. Who, a, a good quality group conscience will take you five minutes. Who's chairing next week? I am. Great. Where's the money going? Okay, you got the checks? Got it. Good. Have a nice day. No, we want to sit here and argue and talk and split hairs and I can't believe you're charging for the coffee. I mean, the coffee should be free. Shut up. Let me tell you this story and get. I had, uh, some of y'all have heard me talk about it and it's still uh, applicable to what we're talking about. Uh, I spent seven years around Alcoholics Anonymous and never felt a part of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I'm going to a whole bunch of meetings, but I can't be a part. Um, 
1987, after that suicide attempt, these guys got hold of me and started shoving me towards the light, and uh, I got sober. Uh, uh, but initially, uh, I mean, the first weekend I'm there, they had me answering the phones at this AA club, and I picked up the phone, and, and you know, and if somebody needed an al meeting, for God's sakes, and I gave them a schedule, and I, I found out I knew the girl. I drank with her husband, and I was there, and I met her and took her to the al and I walked back in. And, but my whole demeanor had changed because I did that. You know, all of a sudden, it's like, y'all don't go near the phone. I got it from now on. I'm Mr. Phone. <laughs> Mr. Phone. But I was a part of that group for the first time. Instead of sitting on the sideline being a being a, a visitor, got any visitors? For seven years. Now all of a sudden I'm a member of a home group and I'm answering their phones and I'm making their coffee. Y'all understand this? And I'm making making mistakes? You betcha. And they're helping me not make those mistakes as many times as I have to. Years ago when I was a, a cyclist, we uh, uh if, if anybody rides road bikes, sooner or later you ride 100 miles. It's a competitive thing. and You just do it. It's a bride of passage. It's like losing your virginity. Nobody really wants to do it, but you got to do it sooner or later. And, um, <laughs> and so we set this thing up. It was going to be a, a, a Saturday ride, and everybody was going to get together. There was about 30 of us. We are going to head out and ride. And it was going to be a slow ride, no big deal, no race. We're just going to ride 100 miles. Period. No big deal. We got out about, we knew it was going to get cold. And we got out on this bike ride, and we headed out about 30 miles out, this cold front. Texas. Guys, y'all realize, look at the map of Texas. There's nothing between the North Pole and Texas but a few fences. There's this, it got cold and it got cold quick. We all had cold weather gear and we all got warmed up and a few people split. They were a little Sunday rider. They didn't want to play. But we said, no, shit, we're going to go. We're going to finish this ride. And we headed on out, guys, because we figured it was going to get lighter Later in the day, it was going to get warmer, silly us. It got colder by much and started to sleep. We were out. We ended up about 65 miles out. We were in a little town, and, and uh, uh, we stopped, and we were dying out there. I, I, it's just too cold. And uh, we put on everything we could put on, and we've eaten all of our food, and we're just we're banged up. And most of the people, we stopped at the store, and they called rides. Can you come pick me up because we're, we're, we're dead out here? And, uh, and I got to tell you, guys, I didn't call anybody simply because there was nobody for me to call that weekend. And... Uh, and I said, I'll go with you. I'll finish this ride. And there was like seven, I forget exactly, there were seven or eight of us that said, we're going to finish this ride. We had 25 more miles to go. And, uh, and we, we were eating nuts. We were eating everything we could eat just to get some energy. Because we're dying, guys. We've been going into a north wind the whole way. And we're not okay. Sun's going down. Nighttime. We're not supposed to be on the road at night. Riding road bikes. Those little, well, we've got to finish this. We've got to get home somehow. So we headed out. This is one of those deals, guys, where everybody made a decision. Usually in a peloton, you know, one will pull for a while, and then you'll drop back to the back, and then the stronger one will get there, and he'll drop back. And everybody takes a turn pulling. Enough of that shit. We, we'd all pulled because there was nothing left to pull. You know, it was, we were, it was all we could do. The strongest riders got in the front and pulled us for 25 miles. There was one guy there that had a little light on his, his bike. We laughed at this guy forever because he had a flashing light on his bike. That is so uncool. You know what I'm saying? In Texas. He had a flashing light, and he rode in the back so the cars could see us because no, it's sleeting out there. They can't see us, and he rode in the back. And we'd hit these metal cattle guards out there. There's metal to keep the cattle in the areas and the pastures, and we're crossing these fields, and we would hit those, and everybody would go down. Everybody would get off the bikes. Everybody would help everybody get back on, clip them back in. Everybody, you with us? You'd be riding up a hill wanting to puke, dying, and you'd feel a hand on your ass pushing because they knew, and it, was, it didn't matter whose hand it was. Just come on. Help me. Y'all understand? The death march. We pulled back down into, into Kerrville, back into the sports center, big lit parking lot where our, our cars were. And we pulled in. It was eight of us. We got in. My odometer clicked over. Click 100. We got off the cars. We put the bikes on the, off the bikes and put them on the racks. We all walked in and took a shower and got in a little sauna. We're sitting around. We're not talking. We're just looking. Hmm? Huh? Huh? Pretty, pretty good, huh? Years later, I quit riding because I didn't have the time, and I and then I started riding again. I bought a nice little Italian bike, went out with them again, and the guys that were sitting there, three of those people were in that group that I was riding with when I went back out there, and they all looked, not a word. Huh? What up, Bubba? You, you remember that? Yeah. Everybody saying what ride? What are y'all talking? Nothing. You wouldn't understand. And you wouldn't understand because you never did it. Don't talk to me about stuff that you don't know anything about. It was a death ride and we survived it because we all worked together. 
We all got in the train. We did what we were supposed to do, and we finished it. And we come to this journey called Alcoholics Anonymous, and we listen to all the mixed messages out there. We treat each other like we're some kind of... You don't feel a part of this because you're not. You know how you'll feel apart? Get active. Ask for help. I don't care how long you're sober. Reach out and ask for help. Get, get past your arrogance thinking that the only people you can learn from are the people that are sober longer than you. Slide up next to somebody that's excited about the work that has just finished another four step and they'll show you how to go through and you'll have a new experience with God. Ultimately, what you're going to do is that you're going to start sponsoring other people. Guys, it's the gravy. I sponsor a gazillion guys. Dr. Bob sponsored over 5,000 people in his 15 years of sobriety. He didn't sponsor 5,000 people doing it the stupid way we do it. I'm going to take you on to raise. I'm going to love you until you can love yourself. Oh, my God. He, he didn't do that. He said, buddy, you ready to go? Let's go. Let's get on the side of the bed and let's have a prayer. Get up. Let's do a four-step. Come on. We're going to go to the detox center tonight. Let's go. You come with us. My gosh. My gosh. In 1987, after I got sober, I was over at another group, and this old guy named ML, he was 40 years sober then. Good gosh, he was an old geezer. And he said, uh, we're washing coffee cups. Everybody else is downstairs. Got a date, chasing women. I'm not. I'm cleaning coffee cups and I'm grateful for the opportunity and I'm sitting there cleaning like that and old, old ML looked over I'm using his name because he's dead now he's passed away a long time but the old geezer looked over like that and he wiped his eyes and I said buddy you've been hanging over that sink he said no buddy I'm not I'm, I'm, I got tears out of my I heard you share tonight and I'm looking at you be a service and it's like it's just it's like night and day from what you used to be you just turned into a real hand here in Alcoholics Anonymous buddy I haven't told you before but I just need to tell you he says, we need you. We need you. Shit. Nobody's told me they needed me. Nobody's told me they needed me in, in, in years. This old geezer washing coffee cups leans over and says, buddy, we need you. I've signed some of your books like that. Listen to me. We need you. I don't want to hear this shit. You haven't been sober long enough. I can't do anything. How can I help anybody? I can't even help myself. Oh, my gosh. I've just got to, one day at a time, just struggle through this thing just the best I can. Shut up. Please. We need you, every single one of you. Listen, let me tell you something, folks. We've got enough people beating people up out there with a big book. We don't need any more big book Nazis out there. We need, we need people with love and compassion to help carry the message. We don't need any more Chris Ramers. We don't need any people spitting fire from the podium. What we need is you. You. Everybody in their own way is going to hear this message. And people, some of you heard the message from me. And some of you are not going to hear the message from me. I'm too rough. I'm too too abrasive. And the person sitting next to you has got a heart of gold and as sweet as can be and can lean over and touch your hand with the love of a mother for her kid. And look at you and say, point blank, do what we ask you to do and your life will change forever. Not one fucking day at a time. Forever. We need you to do it. Because I'm going to tell you something, folks. If you're not there, somebody's going to die. Don't say that nonsense that I can't help anybody. That it's okay, somebody else will get them. You sit in a meeting and a guy gets up and walks out, you go find him. Don't think he's going to come back. Sit there in your complacence, your self-centeredness. Go find him. Sit in the meeting. You guys got this thing, this, this attunement. You know, this, this discernment. You're sitting in a meeting and you can sense that somebody's not in a good space. Don't look the other way and pretend it's not happening. He's fixing to go do something stupid. Go up there, slide up next to him and ask him if he wants to go get a coffee and visit a little bit. Be a responsible member. We're going to lose a gazillion of them, folks, just by the deadly nature of the disease. But we don't have to lose as many as we're losing. Every single one of you need to get involved in this. You don't have to be me. Be you. And we'll turn the tide. Somebody asked it earlier, and I'll, I'll stop. We are turning the tide in this. Success rates of the United States for the first time statistically are on the uprise. Started last year as a direct result of a lot of the primary purpose groups, as a direct result of a lot of the thumpers changing their formats. We're starting to see in the United States, instead of more failures, we're starting to see more successes. People getting in the trench. Yeah.
for every young adult that's sitting in this room that's got a few months sober under your deal and has stayed and taken their spot, even though you took heat from some old geezer that didn't know any better, thank you for sticking. For every one of you women in here that have stayed in this fellowship and raised them babies and put up with the bullshit at home and kept a job and did all that and still managed to make it to the meeting and sponsored people, you will never know how much I appreciate you doing that. For every one of you old geezers that have opened a big book and taken flack because you didn't mind about talking about God and you didn't mind about getting in somebody's face when they started acting like a fool, with, with genuine tears in my eyes, thank you for staying. We need you, every one of you. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.